We have people logging in quickly and we'll, we're going to get started. Um, uh, hopefully you can enjoy the, let's see, there we go. Uh, some of the artwork in the, the book that uh, we're going to be talking about tonight. So we'll, we'll scroll through some of these, the illustrations and sketches uh, as we get started. So. Looks like we're starting to to level off. So I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Hopefully, we'll maybe get one or two more people. But we have a lot of, of people, uh, a lot to get to tonight. So I don't want to wait too long. Uh, so good evening. Uh, my name is Esther Peters. I'm the Associate Director for the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. And I'm excited to welcome everyone to tonight's series of voices with Peter Cease. Uh, we are also excited to welcome Lisa Pick, Charlie Pick, and Karen Wal Pickwald as uh, special guests this evening. Uh, this event is part of our author-centered series of readings and conversations on books from or about Central and Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. Our long-term partner for this series is the Seminary Co-op Bookstores, the first not-for-profit bookstores whose mission is book selling. And although their stores remain closed to the public, they are fulfilling orders and supporting book sales for virtual events like this one through their website, semcoop.com. Uh, when you place your order, you can choose from shipping, delivery to local area codes, or curbside pickup. This evening's event is also co-sponsored by the Joyce Z and Jacob Greenberg Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Chicago. Uh, it's an interdivisional center here at the university. I would also like uh, to thank the Council, the Consulate General of the Czech Republic in Chicago for their help in organizing this event and for their continued support uh, for Czech language studies at the University of Chicago. And finally, uh, special thanks to Otto and Ray Chopek for supporting Czech cultural events at the University of Chicago. Uh, you can find information about upcoming events in our series and other events at semcoop.com and the series website, and we'll put those links into the chat box below. Uh, one upcoming event that might be of interest to members of our audience is the next series of voices, which is uh, a week from today on Tuesday, March 2nd with uh, Olga Liefshin. She'll be discussing her book, A Life Replaced with Eleanor Gilbert. And you can find information and register for that event using the link provided in the chat box as well. Uh, so as I mentioned tonight, uh, we are welcoming Peter Cease, an internationally acclaimed illustrator, author, and filmmaker. He was born in Brno, Czechoslovakia, and attended the Academy of Applied Arts in Prague and the Royal College of Art in London. Uh, his books, Starry Messenger, Galile Galileo Galilei, Tibet Through the Red Box and the Wall, Growing Up Behind the Iron Curtain, were each named Caldecott Honor Books, by the American Library Association, and the wall was also awarded the Robert F. Siebert Medal for the most distinguished informational book for young readers. In addition, he has had seven books named to the New York Times Best Illustrated Book of the Year list. He was the first children's book illustrator to win the MacArthur Fellowship, and in 2012 won the Hans Christian Andersen Award for Lifelong Achievement the highest international recognition given to an author and an illustrator of children's books. Cease was also chosen to deliver the 2012 May Hill Arbutnhut Honor Lecture for the Association for Library Service to Children, and he lives in Irvington, New York. Um, we're also going to be putting some uh, links to uh, his books that are available at the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, and so I encourage you to check those out. Uh, we are also Honored to welcome Lisa Pick and her children, Charlie and Karen. Lisa is one of the 669 children transported from Czechoslovakia to London by Sir Nicholas Winton. Uh, she lives in San Rafael, California and is a retired librarian. She spent over 40 years living and working in the Northeast while raising her family with her late husband, George. They retired to Sonoma, California. Uh, Lisa and George enjoyed over 50 years of marriage with close family, friends, music, and travel. Charlie Pick lives in nearby San Rafael, California, and is an architect. 
His firm, Basis Architecture, addresses affordable housing issues across the USA, and he lives with his wife and has a son. Karen uh, Wald lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and visits San Rafael frequently. She is a speech language pathologist, and she lives with her husband and has two grown children. A couple last notes before we get started. We do have up to 10 copies of Nikki and Vera to give away to interested parties. Please uh, introduce yourself in the chat and let us know if you're interested in being considered for one of those copies. Uh, I should also note that I have confirmed with the bookstore that we were able to procure 10 signed copies. So they, they are also signed by Peter. So, um, uh, which is just an, an added benefit. Um, so there will be time for questions at the end of our event. So please, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box that should be open right now. Um, and at any point, I have a feeling we're gonna have way more questions than we will have time to answer. Uh, and so I will do my best to incorporate those questions when I can, if at all possible. Uh, you also will be able to uh, like a question. So if you see a question that looks really interesting, go ahead and like it, and that'll help us know what questions have the most interest from our audience. Uh, so with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop sharing for the moment. We'll, we'll try and come back to some of these, uh, this beautiful artwork if, if we can, if time allows. Um, but I'm gonna stop for the moment and go ahead and try and uh, uh, bring Peter into this now. Um, so, uh, that was a lot of talking, so I do want to turn this over as quickly as possible to you. Um, I, I've perhaps given a little bit of, of details about the book, but I don't know if you want to give a, a little bit more of a summary about who Nicholas Winton was and, and Vera Guessing and how you, you chose them, uh, and, and how you came to, to write, uh, uh, this Nikki and Vera. Okay, so very nice to be in Chicago with you. It's amazing that I'm sitting here in, on Hudson and I'm with you in Chicago. And this is uh, where I think one of the first um, ideas for the book came from because I was in Chicago as artist in residence in 2007 and the Consul General Marek Skolil, who was in Chicago gave me a book about Nicholas Vinton. I already knew this story from the newspaper, but he said, you should do a book about uh, this amazing man. And I thought the book was so good. The story was so good. Nicholas Linton was so good that it was very hard to think how would I do the book about somebody who did something wonderful, but then he was quiet about it for 50 years. And so I didn't know how to go about it until I found by sheer coincidence, the book by Vera Gissing, who was one of the children called The Pearls of Childhood. And she was describing her childhood in the small town outside of Prague and how she got, because of her mother, sign up for this trip to England when she thought she's just going for a few weeks or a month. Uh, surely she will see her parents again, but she never did. She was with the family in England, which was nice to her. And then she goes through um, the moment when she goes back home, it's nobody back there. and. Then she proceeds with her life, um, getting married, having children, but really the main inspiration was her childhood and how she didn't know anything about uh, the danger coming from Germany, how she was living in the free democratic country, not really very much aware about her Jewish heritage because it wasn't the issue where she lived. So I thought this is the sort of very interesting uh, story to go with Nicholas Vinton's story because Nicholas Vinton for me was a hero but until I really spoke to my son about what does it mean to be a hero in life if it's a sports hero if it's science hero if it's anybody uh, what what does it take and he he was 29 year old young man who traveled to Prague had no reason to get involved with what he did get involved with and because he he could see that he can help. He did arrange for these trains, which took 669 children uh, to, to, to England. And, and then he, for whatever reason, didn't speak about it for uh, next 50 years. And uh, then his wife, or that's part of the story, finds the um, 
a book. He he kept like all the receipts and photographs in this uh, book in 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 the attic. Uh, I think which was given to him by the people who participated on on the whole uh, rescue and and uh, the. I think the book, he, he says, his wife says, like, I found these old photographs, what should I do with it? In, the, in the, his book, uh, of, by his daughter, he, they say, no, you can throw it out. The wife says, no, you can't throw it out. These are the pictures of the children. And she takes it to the researcher in, in Daily Mirror, who then they try to contact all these children as much as they can from the old phone numbers. And, and they arrange for the uh, television performance with a very popular show. And, and the, I think Nicholas Vinton is invited un, under the false pretenses because he thinks it's going to be about something else. He sits in the audience. He, me, he sees somebody who he knows and he says, come sit next to me. And yet these two ladies are trying to sit next to him. He doesn't know why he's little supposedly annoyed by that. And then the announcer, Esther Ratzen, uh, reads his whole story. And then she says, if there's anybody in this room who has some connection to the to, to the uh, trains from Prague and all of a sudden these people around him stand up and he's visibly touched. It's like one of the best moments on television probably because he's a reserved man and he's like this little tear coming out and he's looking and he can't believe this is true. And, and so this was the most amazing moment when my story sort of ends there because these children who are now grown up people come to him and they all have like a little child inside of them because the whole life happened in between. And then I have a tree with lots of hearts and, and, and you see the shores of Europe with more refugees coming in because that's the, that's the situation now when one of the children from this train is Lord uh, Alfred Dubbs, who's, who's actually working very hard to, to get this uh, law or situation that the children refugees would be let in, into England. So he's continuing this legacy. And, and so that's the story of my book. And uh, I would say that what was amazing also to do the research was to find out that all the children we know about uh, as Miss Pick would be working in some some sort of trying to help other people to do to, to do wonderful things, which I thought it's not just the people who were famous film directors or poets or scientists, but all of them are trying to make sense of, of, of humanity, really, which is wonderful. Well, that uh, kind of brings me to another question I had uh, when, you know, tied to uh, one, writing a, a book that involves uh, real people and real historical events and the challenge of that, um, but specifically dealing with an event like this, uh, with something that, that has, with such a kind of traumatic historical period when you're talking about World War II and the Holocaust, um, and, and what those, what were the challenges uh, for you in terms of, of how, what to include in a book for children? Uh, did that present any particular challenges? Certainly you've, you've written about other historical figures, you've written about Galileo, you've written about your own life. Did this book pre pre uh, present unique challenges uh, because of, of that? Um, yes, 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 yes. It's, it's, it, that was something I didn't really think about when I got going because really the issue was how to deal with Nicholas Vinton himself as a man and he was a reserve man and he was a fencer and he was a banker and he was a young man who liked to drive and ski and fly and and I was thinking about him and but then I started to do uh, looking for Vera and looking for other things and uh, looking at other children who who may be because part of it was a uh, letter from my, my school friend, really, from the art school I went to. I have a friend who now lives in Los Angeles, and she told me story after all these years. I had no idea that she has a sister which was 15 years older, and her mother took her sister. She signed her up for the, for the, um, for, for the train. She brings her to the train station and puts her on the train, but then she decides that no way she can leave her on the train, that it's just, she, it can't be done. And she takes her out again and um, and they both go home and then they both end up in Terezin. And, and 
in Terezin, uh, Terezinstadt concentration camp. And as my friend said, luckily they both survived. Another lucky girl got the place on the train probably. So that girl survived, my sister survived, but both learned about how awful the war is in a different way. And that was the research which I started to do and read lots of books about the, not just girls from, from Prague, but the, the little Dutch girls like Anne Frank and people who uh, were not so so lucky. And then it opened this whole question of, of the incredible, um, incredible uh, darkness and, and cruelty, which, and all of a sudden I always took Prague. I grew up in Prague. So in my previous books, I would, look at the cobblestones in Prague and think about how history took place in, in 17th century or 19th century. But all of a sudden, this was so close to my life. And I realized I knew lots of people who were, grew up in England or were born in England, but also were probably on these trains. But as a young boy growing up in Prague, people didn't really speak about it. So it was this whole issue how to deal with things I might have been uh, touched touching but really didn't know and, and discovering this whole part of history which also went to the moment when the war is over and people are coming back home but then all of a sudden the attitudes seem to be much more um, not as the idealism of the first republic before the war because of the whole history of second world war and then immediately comes the communist takeover and it gets all sort of um, mixed up in, in some awful way when, when this doesn't get proper sort of uh, reception at, at, in, in, in Prague. I, I remember that we grew up in schools showing pictures from the concentration camps, but we were always told these are the communists, how they were treated by the Germans. I mean, the whole, uh, let's say, Jewish question was pushed into the background completely. So for me, it was sort of um, discovery also because each book I did in my life, I was dealing with that, with that part of, of, of history. Uh, I would always discover other things than they are in, in historical books, like with Galileo, like with Charles Darwin. Uh, the only thing I could talk about was uh, really to doing a book about the time behind the Iron Curtain and communism, which was interesting because I immediately came the criticism of now you are serving to your um, Masters in America, something which is absolutely like from the Russian propaganda textbook. And here, um, I already got some criticism for this book because there is an ongoing discussion that uh, Nicholas Vinton couldn't be alone, that he had a whole group of people who held him and they should get the more, uh, more of the, but I, I have a only format of the children's book, so I can't really, and he lived so long and he was, I think, essential person for it. So I now openly talk about that I should have maybe given him bigger space. I have a picture how they sit in Cafe Slavia all together and they are plotting. As well as I, I admit that uh, Nicholas Vinton, when he comes to Prague, he goes to hotel where he sort of sets up his office. That hotel was called Schrobeck. I put in Hotel Europa because now it's called Hotel Europa. So I found out, but it takes me so long to draw a picture that it was like I thought, <laughs> I better talk about it and say, look, I made a mistake. It's not called Hotel Europa. It was called Hotel Schrobeck, but please don't make me redo it. <laughs> well, that's, um, um, I, at least in, in this moment, I, I, can, I can understand that, that decision to not redraw the picture. Maybe uh, a little. <laughs> um, I, I do, just to speak to that, uh, one of the things I, I found particularly interesting about how you tell this story in the book is the ways in which you t you intertwine the story of Nicholas Winton and Vera Gissing, which you know we we learn about Nicholas's childhood and then we learn about Vera's childhood, and it it really keeps them um, for me at least on an equal footing, uh, and and it really rather than having like one big hero and one person that needs to be saved it really makes it easier to see the world through both of their eyes and to connect with them. I don't know. Um, so I, I guess I was wondering if that was done on, if that was on purpose or, uh, you know, who are, you know, I, you know, that, that as a child or an adult reading it, 
you can see, you can think through what would you do if you were in Nicholas Winton's shoes, but also how would you feel if you were in Vera's shoes? Because you can see Nicholas growing up and, and liking pigeons and Vera, when she's growing up, she's the queen of the cats and she loves cats. And so they, you know, and, and you, you watch that, that trajectory and related to that is, is um, you know, what, what do you hope people get out of this book as they're reading it, either children or adults as, as they're reading it? Well, I think the, to answer your uh, the first part of the question was that once I had the idea that Vera would be Vera would be his sort of I would I would look at his life, which was uh, of course started to happen twenty years before hers. But I thought I would start I would show that child's life seems to be always the same. I start each book, if it's Galileo, if it's, if it's uh, Darwin, if it's uh, San Exupery with a little baby, because it's a baby which is born into uh, circumstances. But I didn't know, I think in the first version, and I think it was maybe the editor, Simon Bolton, because he's from England, so he was like immediately responding to idea of doing book about Nicholas Vinton, because it's also incredibly brave part of history of England when the United Kingdom was the only uh, country which was receiving refugees under 17 years and, and giving them sort of uh, asylum. So I, I knew that would be these two stories, but in the beginning I was intrigued by the fact that they almost, at one time they were, they had like equal stories. They both had wife, two children or three children they might have been living, even somebody said now they lived very close to each other and they wouldn't know they are connected through this one short experience in Prague when Nicholas Vinton arranges for the trains and uh, little Vera happens to be on this train, but she doesn't really see him or thinks thinks about it, what's happening. I, I don't know, it's very hard to think how did children um, think in that time. Maybe uh, Miss Big can, can tell us more about that. And, but then came the idea, and it was my <laughs> wife's idea that these children drawings sort of start to change into her diary. When she also, in her book, describes the first time she would taste the uh, salty water from the La Mancha. I guess she lived somewhere near Liverpool, so probably not the other side. But then she has fish and chips, and then she's uh, she realizes that uh, the English bread is so white and soft and she does. So it's like all these observations which I thought would be part of this extensive diary. Then I actually left the diary sort of blank because she's also becoming, she's 11 years old when the whole story begins. And, and I knew the children on the trains were from age three to age 16 or up to, up to really the, the, the 17 years, but um, she becomes adolescent and she goes to school in Wales where there is a Czech, Czechoslovak school in, in Wales, which she uh, hears for the first time on BBC in 1943. There might be um, these concentration camps. It's like the first time she hears about it. And she has no news from home. So she says, I hope my parents are okay. I hope they are not being uh, victims, but she doesn't know. So this was the idea to sort of um, balance both stories while well, I left Nicholas more quiet because he lives outside, he takes care of his garden. I put in little uh, boxes what was happening because he was working for uh, the retirement homes. Uh, he was working for hospitals for uh, children with, with um, difficulties because he had one child, which was also amazing because in that time, everybody would put a child into institution, but he refused and would take care of the child with his wife. So I left these things all in the sort of background when you're supposed to make your own conclusion. And I think it's really about human life. It's about life we, we all have beginning and the end. And I think it's amazing that was this moment when he really changed um, uh, destiny of so many people and never uh, would go and claim some some, I mean, he wouldn't just uh, take the credit for it, which is also pretty stunning in this age of celebrities and, and people who would always say, I climbed that mountain or I swam across the ocean. So he was a very humble, wonderful man. And often I was wondering, again, I don't know how really the children them, themselves growing up felt about it and their children, and ch but maybe we will find out today. That's. 
that that is a great segue. I think this is a really good time to to perhaps um, uh, see if we can't uh, bring uh, Lisa in into the conversation and uh, if you would be willing to kind of share your experience and and how you experienced uh, leaving Czechoslovakia, getting on a train and and arriving in in London or arriving in in England. Well, it's a little hard to know where to begin exactly. And you know the story about uh, Nicholas Winton, what he did um, to get children uh, out. Um, and this is a different, I, I do want to emphasize, this is not the same as the German or Austrian kind of transport. This is Winton's children getting out of Czechoslovakia. And, um, he had to do everything very, very quickly and make the arrangements with Britain very, very quickly. They um, insisted that each uh, child had to have a place to already settled to go to. That was an address. Uh, my parents knew the address where I would be. Uh, in order to do that, they quickly assembled a book with all the 60, well, they had more, they had a thousand, I think, pictures, uh, photographs of us. I was nine. And um, so not all thousand, only 669, because after that, the war began. And that was the end of that. Um, I was on the last train, the train after me uh, was all set to go, all the children on the train and the Germans pulled them off the train and um, none survived a parent that I know. Uh, that. And so um, I was one of the very fortunate 669 to be picked by a family in Scotland. I think the reason I was picked was um, that they had a daughter who was one year older, we were both only children. And they were thinking of it in terms of a companion. At the time, everybody assumed that it was for two or three months. My parents said they will follow me in two or three months. And of course, uh, once the war started, that did not happen. And so I spent seven years in with my Scottish family. Uh, it was situated uh, in a place called Airdrie uh, between on the main road between Glasgow and Edinburgh. And my guardian was a, a minister of the Church of Scotland. So I grew up for seven years in a manse. <laughs> and not only was it the Church of Scotland, but it was the Calvinist version, John Knox, and very, very strict. Now I had had, I was not brought up in any religion whatsoever. Jew, non-Jew, I had no idea about any of that. On my birth certificate, it says no religion, which was an official, um, uh, in the Czech, uh, an official, um, designation, both my children, my, both my parents were Jewish, but they did not observe any religion. So uh, to me, um, the Jews were people who lived 2000 years ago that I read about in the Bible. That's all I knew. I, I um, had a constricted life there, but um, I have a very soft spot for Scots uh, 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 and Scottish people, they were extremely kind. And at school, they were kind. And uh, it's just I wasn't allowed um, to do things that um, other children my age were able to do. So um, it was a bit lonely, but there were two of us. Um, uh, my foster sister and I became closer as we got older. 
And uh, so uh, the year, the reason I wasn't there for six years, I was there for seven years. Uh, my parents spent four years in Terezin, but they survived. And they were desperately trying to leave uh, Czechoslovakia. And so they thought, well, if I could just stay a little bit longer in England, it would be easier for them. The Iron Curtain had come down. Uh, the government was, it was before the coup, uh, but it was very, very communist already. And it was, all, it was really almost impossible to get out. So finally, I did go back. And I was back for 18 months and uh, learned Czech and uh, didn't do much as far as schooling was concerned. I really didn't want to be there. I felt, uh, I felt British. And <laughs> so anyway, but uh, the reason I, I finally found out that I was a Jew was because when we saw, when we heard about the camps, I finally put two and two together. So anyway, so I was there Oh, for 18 months. And uh, finally, documents about this high, uh, we were able to leave uh, because we had a sponsor in Montreal, Canada. And that was just nip and tuck. Uh, we kept it a secret. We were leaving um, all sorts of drama, uh, but we got out. Uh, and uh, ended up in, uh, <laughs> in a February Atlantic Ocean in a troop ship, British troop ship had been Aquitania. Um, anyway, we got, I always remember arriving in Halifax. Oh, it took 10 days, there were icebergs, <laughs> a horrible trip. Anyway, we ended up at Halifax on Valentine's Day, February 14th. Welcome to Canada. And on the way to Montreal, we got snowbound in the train. <laughs> so I thought this was all very exciting. Uh, and I was looking for Indians out there, but there weren't any Indians uh, or sleds. Uh, just a lot of snow. And um, my parents, uh, we settled in Montreal. And um, they had to adjust to a new life completely, of course, at the age of 50 and 48. They were always so happy there. They bought a little house, modest little house. Uh, they, uh, my father was an engineer. And um, they said, they're happy, just leave us alone. Just nobody, please bother us, they were free. And um, I um, went to McGill University there. And I don't think it need, they need to know all this. So uh, <laughs> Columbia, I went to, uh, um, I don't know if I'm giving you what you want. Um, <laughs> how did it feel? How did it feel to go? Uh, when I left, I thought, I, I was sort of thinking I was on a, an adventure and when our train passed through Holland and I saw a windmill, I got so excited. And the only bad part was uh, we arrived in London, uh, which I now know is Liverpool station. And we had our names here to be picked up and nobody was picking me up. Uh, uh, finally, they put me on a train with a little boy about my age and uh, we um, went up to, to Edinburgh. So that was, how do you feel? Well, it wasn't always easy at the beginning. I always knew that um, I really, you know, this was another country for me from where I had come. I, I did speak only English. I forgot both Czech and German, which we spoken at home. And so um, it, it, what it does to you is that it gives you, or I think my life, a sort of um, double identity. 
because you lived in a completely different atmosphere from what you had lived in before and after. And of course, after we had the difficult period, by the way, the communist coup took place two weeks after we had left otherwise. So we were fortunate. Somebody said to me, oh, uh, you're the, what was it? The, the, the last, the last resort kid or something like that, because I always got away just before. <laughs> and um, so I was, I've been very fortunate in my life. I uh, got a graduate degree at Columbia in library science. I met my husband. Uh, we had, I don't know, where, where is Charlie? Well, I, he's, he's there. He's right here. I can bring, I can, let, let's, let's, uh, bring uh, Charlie and, and uh, Karen in to the, to the picture, perhaps. Um, so I think we all had a happy family. I hope they think so. Yeah, we don't need to have that out here. No, <laughs> <laughs> it was all good. <laughs> well, um, I, I know we, we talked earlier uh, about uh, actually meeting uh, Nicholas Winton, and I don't know, Charlie, if you wanted to to talk about your experiences meeting meeting him and what that was like uh, for you. Well, I've always been deeply fascinated by the history of our family, and I think I really, you know, worked on this idea of connecting with um, our family history. Uh, I'm I'm a history buff you know, uh, just as a hobby. Um, so maybe that feeds into it. But um, as soon as I could, um, I started, you know, I always wanted to go back to Prague and see what it was like and actually made it back in 1989, you know, just before the events of late 89 that we all know about. Um, and then I went to Prague uh, every year uh, even considered moving over there. I was very, very attached to this idea of our Czech heritage. And um, later on, uh, I just got it in my head that I really, really wanted to uh, meet uh, Sir Nicholas and spend some time with him. And uh, it happened. It happened much later. Um, my kid was, I guess, uh, 12 and uh, we were taking a European trip. We had gone to Croatia and whatnot. And I, but I had gotten in contact a couple years earlier with Barbara Winton and we corresponded frequently. I had met her in San Diego and we attended an event together, et cetera. Um, and it was rather simple for her to, uh, you know, just tell her dad that we were gonna stop by one afternoon. And uh, so, me, my wife, and my kid uh, did stop by. We flew to London, rented a car, drove out to Maidenhead, and um, you know, knocked on the door and you know, heard, "Come on in." Um, there was nobody else there. He was just sitting there, hanging out. Um, and I guess it was just really surprising because somehow. You know, I thought he would have attendants or staff or, you know, or something, but, but no, he was just a 104 year old guy hanging around the house, you know, uh, spending the afternoon vegetating, as he said, that was his own word for just sitting there in his favorite brown chair and reading a book, you know, or watching the birds fly by. Later on, uh, one of his sons did show up and um, we chatted a little bit. But we wound up spending the afternoon with him and uh, he's just a very low key guy. He, um, we wound up going to the nearby pub, his favorite pub, having something to eat and drink. Um, and it was, it was a, a fascinating afternoon. I remember trying really hard not to just talk about the experiences of my mom and everything that he did and what he was famous for. But, but really tried to focus more on the idea that we were sitting there uh, chatting with somebody who was 104 years old and had experienced everything and 
and frankly, somebody who had experienced everything with a rather critical eye. Uh, he had his opinions on things. Um, he was extremely, extremely critical of our generation, uh, my generation in any case, baby boomers, uh, Gen X. Anyway, he was extremely unimpressed with what was going on in the world circa 2013. He felt that people had just been overwhelmed by selfishness and petty um, concerns and lost interest in helping others. Um, but he didn't, he didn't come off as a cranky old guy at all. I mean, he was just making a perfectly rational, um, non-pejorative kind of observation that this is where our society has gone, you know, and he was not impressed with it. Um, so it was really fascinating. And um, he did essentially challenge all of us to do something good with ourselves, um, not by saying it, but just sitting there in the room with him and you realize what he did and for how many people. And, and I came away from that, all three of us came away from that, you know, just really feeling like, wow, we were given this gift. I mean, this guy is essentially like my third parent. And, um, you know, you walk into the room and meet him and shake his hand and realize that, you know, if it wasn't for this individual, I simply wouldn't exist, you know, and neither would my son. So that's, that's a weird feeling. And it never occurred to me until the moment we walked into that room. Um, so, I had to come away from that feeling challenged to do something useful, you know, and I, it actually led me down a path for the next few years. I tried to get involved with organizations that were helping refugees and some political um, organization that I was trying to do. But frankly, that wasn't really in my skill set. So I decided to simply just do more. Uh, than ever at what I know how to do, and that's um, help create and preserve affordable housing. And interestingly, um, in Winton's later life, uh, that's what he did too. He was involved with uh, the construction and the development of two uh, senior housing projects in his area, you know, in his neighborhood there near Maidenhead. So that really animated him. So that was pretty cool. Um, there... <laughs> You know, there, there was a lot of emotion, you know, with that visit uh, that I still feel today, um, ranging from just humorous stuff, like the guy loved chocolate, every single horizontal surface in his house, from his kitchen, through his living room, everywhere you went, there was some item of chocolate sitting there. And his, his attitude was like, hey, you know, I'm 104, I like my chocolate, and that's the way it is. I'm going to eat my chocolate, you know? Okay, we're good with that. Absolutely we reasonable. Chocolate. Yeah, we brought him some chocolate, some Giardelli chocolate from San Francisco. He was thrilled. That was, that was a little bit later when I visited with my mom, so I'm jumping ahead. But a, a really funny anecdote was when we went to the pub, and we sat down and they kind of treated him normally there, even though it was practically next door to his home. And, and I just, at, at one point I just asked him, I said, you know, you're a knight, you are a sir, you're a knight. I mean, aren't they supposed to treat you somehow special in town here? You know, this is your place. And he, he's like, you know, I never thought of it, but you're right. I should have a taller glass of beer than you guys have. So, <laughs> so we suggested that to the management on the way out that they take care of that detail from now on. Um, but when we left hours later, um, I realized that there was absolutely no way that I could accept this state of circumstances where my mother had never met him. And so uh, we got organized and a year and a few months later, um, off we went from California to uh, London and then on to Maidenhead and uh, had another sit down, this time just me and my mother and, and spent some time with him. And he had lost a little bit of his mental faculties, facilities by that point. And 
he 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 left us only a few months later. But um, I can turn it back to my mom and ask her what she thought of that visit because um, I thought it was pretty uh, pretty excellent. Well, uh, it really was an exciting, a uh, very exciting experience. Uh, he was by then. Uh, uh, he wasn't getting up anymore or anything. A uh, neighbor went by, came by, and we all uh, had just had a very easy chat for a couple of hours. And um, I went away so grateful that Charlie had made me visit him and that I had seen him. Yeah, I closed the loop. It was it was a really great moment. It sounds it does it sounds like that I, I know we're we're I want to get to some of these questions that are starting to come in and, and please keep the questions coming um, Karen I wanted to give you a chance you, you you had said earlier about the kind of the ripple effects and and Peter had talked about this a little bit as well in his his comments I don't know if you wanted to, to add on to that about sure. um, about that sure I think you know one of the things that yeah, you can hear me. Um, one of the things I wanted to remark on from 669 children, there's now over 6,000 descendants um, from the 669 and, and growing that ripple effect of my mother having had her life saved. Here we are, two of us. And we've, between the two of us, there's three more. And, you know, so it goes. And I think that ripple effect is just something, it's hard to overlook. It, it's, it's quite profound. But another ripple effect is the fact that this foster sister uh, that my mother spent seven years in their family home in Scotland, Nina, um, had two children as well. And um, as a family, we knew them uh, quite well. We spent summers uh, as adolescents together. Uh, we would go to Scotland, live there for the summer, and they came to us in New Jersey. Um, we've continued to be in touch with them. Um, Nina has passed away, as has um, her husband, but we are definitely in touch with the children and their children. So as big and as incredibly profound as uh, Nicholas Winton was for our family, I would say that uh, he has a pretty profound impact on theirs as well. So that ripple effect, I think, is just something important uh, as we you know, look at humanity and how, how we are with one another. So I'll leave it at that. That's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm going to try and pull out some uh, questions for, for everyone. But Peter, I, I know you might have, I don't know if you wanted to, to ask a question of, of Lisa or Charlie or Karen or, or. I want to ask one question which people keep on asking me. And I wouldn't know because I wouldn't until now had nobody to ask. In the time before he became, he, he sort of, well, became famous for, for doing this. Were you thinking about who might have done it or was it because so much stuff happened during the war that this was never, it was just the fact that there were trains going to England or, you know, people asking me if people were trying to find out who he was, but since they didn't know who he was, I don't think how would they be asking about that? I don't, I don't know. I was very isolated from all my background up in Scotland. There was a Czech school the last few years uh, in Wales, and they may have known something else. But basically, I don't think anybody till 1988 knew who it was. Uh, and uh, my parents didn't talk about anything. And I never felt free to ask about anything, basically. And um, I, I think people just thought, um, oh, this was an organization that got his children out. I don't know. It was a rather big unknown, Mom, right? Mom, it was just a big unknown, really. Yes. Yeah. But also your story is so wonderful that it shows that if I didn't find a book of Vera Gissing, I could, you know, be doing maybe 669 different books when I would have a story of Nicholas Renton <laughs> and show always the child which uh, life was, was saved by him, so. By, by the way, Peter, just circling back on a question that you said you've been asked or, or challenged, even critiqued on, 
the organization uh, that he had was, he was in Czech, as you know, he was in Prague at this hotel. And I think he had a couple of assistants and um, they basically fabricated this organization. I mean, they didn't have anything. They just printed some letterhead that looked official and kind of pretended to have right. an organization. And then the London end of it, you know, of course, they had to have set up these foster homes essentially and have a target, like my mom said, they're a specific sponsor place that family they were going to be going to. Um, that was his mother who did that. Um, and that was it. So that was their organization. It was well, all in the family. Few, there were a few yeah. more people. Yeah, she had some helpers, but, yeah, so, so, uh, but yeah. so from Barbara's book, it's interesting that he accomplished the whole thing being on vacation as a stockbroker, really. Yeah. And then being back home, he goes to work every day. And then in the afternoons and in the evenings with his mother, he writes all these requests. And even he also writes to President Roosevelt and he writes to all different uh, governments if they could take more children and everybody's going through this. We have to put it through the Congress and did like, like three months really left between his arrival to Prague and the beginning of the war when he um, gets these trains going. But but uh, he, he always, he says in the book that he could have done more of course if he had more response around the world, which he, he was a 20, 28 year old stockbroker right, who went on right. a ski trip, 28 right. years old. He never made it skiing. No. no. no so I, I put it. I put it in the book that I. I like some people said. Well, he knew, but the, by the time he was going to Prague, he's not going skiing because his friends had come to Prague. It's like important uh, stuff going on. But I still made him going with the skis, so I would show the the sudden sort of decision that he leaves the skis and he says, "I can deal with this. I can. I can work through all this." So. Um, and by the way, uh, that, uh, when he came, I don't know how many months it took, a few months, but March 15th, uh, the Germans invaded already. So uh, uh, that whole time between March and the end of July, the Germans were there. I, re I remember the SS books. But so the, uh, the Germans were also watching the trains leaving, probably, right? I mean, and that would be my next question if like, it must have been so hard that the parents, that the children, when you went to the train, like I, nobody I would want to cry or be that. sad because you don't want to. I didn't it. feel it, you but my mother it. ran a whole length of the platform, I remember, as the train was going up. So That's what crazy. what the parents must have felt. You, you're a parent, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's in, in program, yeah. Well, if uh, if uh, perhaps I could I could bring up uh, some questions and and uh, that have been coming in and I just uh, I know Peter uh, how important you know wanting to kind of go back to some of the artwork uh, this question is from Monica and she's curious about your illustrations uh, she says there are babies in cradles a face of a leopard inside a hill a whale and the circular labyrinths um, and she just wants to know if you could talk about that a little bit. No, it was just a simple decision of the old illustrator by now, because I knew Nicholas Vinton was sort of like reserved and didn't really show that much emotion in the life story, which I only knew from the book of his daughter and then two other books. So he was for me like sort of more in black and white drawing with just the little uh, colors. And I wanted to have a little girl with um, almost like a child's drawing, but child's drawing is so impossible to do because the children are the best and you can always tell it's fake. So I sort of invented this style because in her book, she writes like how she was running around the town and, and, and playing with the cats and, and climbing the tree. So it was supposed to be this vision of a child, which of course, uh, would be much better if it was a child. And I had Prague in distances, the city, which is like far away because she says they only went occasionally to meet family and then they would go to synagogue, but otherwise it was never the issue. And for me, it was also sort of how I imagined Czechoslovakia was before the war. 
when really people were so excited that this is a new democratic country and and uh, uh, they they sort of like celebrated Masaryk and and the fact being Czech that they would be religious and I sent the book to Madan and Albright who 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 actually said. I was uh, on the birthday party uh, meeting Nicholas Vinton, a most modest hero. Um, and she has a special connection, she says, because of her cousin Dasha was on one of the trains. She came to England and stayed with us. The horror is that her parents, my aunt and uncle, decided not to send her younger sister who ended up in Terezin and died. So that's from Madeleine Albright, who has sort of personal connection to this. And I realized also, there are lots of tragedies. There are also people who would be um, like, like meeting their parents or meeting, um, there were people, the children who came and then let's say father was in England. But the, so it's like different stories, but, but um, so she had this story and, and everybody uh, has a memory of Nicholas Vinton being very humble. Then it was interesting that somebody also told me that he was very critical about, he, that he said people don't learn from history at all. People do not uh, learn the lessons of, of history, that he himself being the hero of history didn't believe that it made any, any difference really. But I think it would be better if you speak because you have so much, I just drew the book, which now I have lots of questions about, so please. Well, uh, this, uh, there's a, a question or maybe a, a comment for Lisa. Um, from Sally Williams and, and she says it must have been very difficult to be in a different country and not speak the language at age nine. So I don't know if you wanna kind of, if, if you have anything to add to that about arriving in- I don't, no. Uh, no. As I said, we really thought it was just for a couple of months and obviously you have to adjust to a completely new life, uh, but uh, I think both both my mother and my father were immersed with English all around them at age nine, be it in Canada for my father and my mother um, um, in Scotland. And I think at age nine, happily, your mind is a sponge. And so you did learn English quite quickly, you know, because that's that was the only way. Oh, I'm a great. Um, um... I can't think of the word, but uh, I feel that Im total immersion is very important. And the younger the child, the easier it is to learn another language in full, just full immersion. That's uh, um, another, this one's uh, for Peter, uh, says from uh, Pierce says, Mr. Cease, how do you think we can best preserve and promote the Czech language and culture? Well, I'm not the best one to ask because I have two children and they do not speak uh, very much Czech since my wife is American, which I, when they were born, I thought we move forward and they are American and it was still communist country. And so now when I get old, I go like, it would be nice if they would speak Czech, but they don't. So. It's, it's, it's difficult and I, I wrote it in a few of the books, they will decide. People said I should have spent more time and read to them. So I think it's great that the whole attitude changed now with the, the world being, people want to know about their roots, want to learn the languages. I think it was a little different time when you decide that you can't live in that system and then you decide to leave. So it, it was a different sort of philosophy for me. So, um, they're still very proud to, of the heritage and, and, and actually it's an advantage for them because they don't know about the bad things. So they think it's the most wonderful <laughs> country with the people who are just great and they have great beer and they dance and they are just happy all the time. So so I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a better story how uh, I'm, I'm trying to do in my books to uh, bring out certain things from the history or uh, the connection between, between uh, life here and there, and, and that's my sort of gift to that whole movement. Well, well, we are we have reached seven o'clock, uh, which is the end of our time, unfortunately. Uh, so I want to, on behalf of all of our sponsors and everybody who helped organize this event, I want to thank Peter and Lisa and Charlie and Karen for 
coming and uh, sharing, Peter for sharing this wonderful book, Lisa for sharing uh, your story and Charlie and Karen as well. Uh, it has been a wonderful evening. Um, if does, if any, I, I will turn it over if anybody has any last words they, they want to, to offer before we, we sign off. But I do want to, again, just really thank you for, for just a lovely evening. Well, thank you, Esther, also. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you so much. So, uh, so yes, thank you to everyone who uh, joined us um, this evening. It was great to see so many, well, virtually see uh, so many people be able to join us. It was uh, lovely. And um, I hope some of you will join us next week as well. So have a good night. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you very much.